For more on this, we're now being joined by Alon Bootstein. He's an assistant professor and an Israeli Institute fellow at the Department of Political Science at the University of California. He's joining us live from California. Thanks very much for taking our time and joining us on Beyond, Alan. Thank you for having me. Right, now, Mr. Bootstein, these are unprecedented times. Israel says it is at a war after Hamas's surprise attack, and Netanyahu has threatened off an unprecedented retaliation and has launched Operation Iron Swords. What can we expect in the coming few hours? Well, honestly, it is uh, regrettably very hard to know because this is unprecedented. In the history of the Israeli-Arab conflict, there have been a lot of instances in wars between Israel and Jordan, Israel and Egypt, where there were mass amounts of people, of prisoners of war that were taken. This is unprecedented. In the wars that Israel has had with the various insurgent organizations around them, whether they were in Lebanon or in Gaza or in the West Bank, occasionally there have been three, at the most, three to five soldiers that were kidnapped, sometimes killed, sometimes not, and Israel launched massive retaliations to get them back. This situation, where a militant organization with far decreased capabilities compared to the IDF managed to surprise the Israeli Defense Forces so greatly, kill 300 people, which is an unprecedented number at least, and kidnapped, some reports are saying, over 100 civilians and soldiers into Gaza, is so unprecedented that it's hard to know what's going to happen. Israel's usual retaliation towards rockets launched from Gaza into the center of the country is to launch attacks from the skies and occasionally invade Gaza on the ground, but it's never had to deal with a situation where there are also at least probably 100 civilians that are being held captive in Gaza. So it's really impossible to know what Israel can do. It's very constrained. Right, Mr. Bustin, I was just coming to that, the issue of captivity here. Now, what is different this time is that Hamas has taken a number of Israeli hostages. Uh, I want to seek your perspective if that can be used as a bargaining tool. So that is the aim of the Hamas operation. Um, historically, when different organizations, terror organizations, either in Lebanon or in Gaza, have kidnapped usually Israeli soldiers, they were used as then bargaining chips in order to secure the release of Palestinian prisoners that are held by Israel. And usually in the last case this happened in 2011, one Israeli soldier was released in response to the release of over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. So that when the current leader of Hamas in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar, came to the leadership. He pledged that his goal was to release all Palestinian prisoners, as well over 8,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. He pledged to release them all. If we look at that ratio, where one soldier was traded for 1,000 Palestinian prisoners, right now, if Hamas is in fact holding 80 to 100, some reports say even more, citizens and civilians and children and old, older people and soldiers in, in captivity, their hope is to secure the release of all Palestinian prisoners. It is unclear, though, that that will happen because that will require enough political cohesion in Netanyahu's government in order to make such a deal, which he will not be able to have with his current coalition. So such a deal saying all the civilians that were kidnapped by Hamas will be released and all Palestinian prisoners will be released is not going to be that simple at all. We're likely looking at a very big escalation, unfortunately, in the coming days and weeks until something changes. Right, Mr. Bursti. Now, U.S. and the Western allies have a short support for Israel. We've seen the past few hours strong statements coming in from Biden and Blinken. How do you assess the kind of support that the West will give Israel? Well, as often is the case that the West and certainly the allies, um, natural allies of Israel, um, tend to support Israel's right to defend itself. However, as re Israeli retaliations often get out of control, and as you start to see more and more people that are not involved in fighting in the Gaza Strip being hurt or killed in Israeli raids, that support starts to dwindle. All of a sudden, you start to see the United States starts to tell Israel, okay, you now have another two or three days to complete your operation because we can't defend you in the UN any longer. What's different in this case is the monumental extent of the Hamas operation. The Hamas operation kidnapping their children that were being ripped away from their parents. is video footage of children being ripped away from their parents and kidnapped into the Gaza Strip, kidnapping civilians, kidnapping, again, elderly people. That is going to garner more negative connotations against Hamas and give Israel more leeway and more support internationally to do whatever it has to do 
in order to retrieve its people, in order to defend itself. So I think we're likely to see on a diplomatic level a lot of support for Israel in the coming days, virtually no matter what it does. After that, depending on how things unfold, if Israel does indeed invade the Gaza Strip with actual ground forces, then it depends how things develop on the ground. Right, Mr. Burstein. My last question to you. How do you look at the role of Iran in the latest attack uh, with the U.S. saying that it has not seen Tehran's hand as of now in backing Hamas? So Iran and Hamas have a long history. Iran has been an ally of Hamas since 1991 and has funded Hamas and has hosted its leadership and has tried to smuggle weapons. Their relationship, though, they had a falling out in 2011 after Hamas sided with the rebels in Syria and Iran sided with the Assad regime. And the Hamas, sorry, Iran stopped supporting Hamas for a couple of years. Since 2017, 2018, Hamas has very, very methodically rebuilt its relationship with Iran, has invested a lot in rebuilding its relationship with Assad and Syria also. And in the last couple of years, Iran has become much more influential in supporting Hamas and helping guide it. It's not clear, and I would argue that Iran probably did not tell Hamas do this. Iran did not say, now is a good time, now we want you to strike. What they did probably promise is that they will help finance, that they will help offer logistical support that if need be, they can activate Hezbollah in Lebanon. So there probably is support, and Iran probably knew this was coming, but this is not them activating Hamas in the Middle East in their interest. It's more they're agreeing to help, the, help Hamas in what it's doing. Right, Mr. Burstein, thanks very much for joining us and we're sharing your insights on this. We'll, of course, be tracking this very closely right here on Beyond. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'll probably talk to you in the next couple of days. Have a good day.